Matt Bard joins me. He's the co-host of the Fourth and Gold podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Doug. Thank you so much for having me on, man. Yeah, man. I'm glad uh, we could make this happen. Uh, so the game is in uh, Arizona, right? The game will be in Arizona, yes. Yeah. So the 49ers are were forced to play two games in Arizona because of the COVID restrictions from Santa Clara County. So Santa Clara County basically said there's going to be a two-week quarantine. Anybody traveling into Santa Clara County, which obviously wouldn't work because Washington wouldn't be able to come over two weeks early, and neither would Buffalo uh, last night or two nights ago, excuse me, as recorded on Wednesday. Uh, so, yeah, they're playing in Arizona for the second straight game. It's actually going to be three out of four weeks in Arizona because they have to go back there to play the Cardinals in week 16. Oh, man. Uh, what has Kyle said about the difficulties of giving that home field up? Oh, he hasn't said a whole lot about the home field advantage aspect, more or less the fact that they are separated from their families during this time. You know, in between Thanksgiving and Christmas is a lot of time when a lot of these guys have young families. You know, you think these football players are mostly somewhere in between the range of 24 and 30. And generally, that's when you have real little ones running around. You don't want to miss a bunch of time with them in a season where you're already on the road a lot. You're already at practice. You're already so focused on football. It's tough to kind of keep that mental edge when you're, you're being told you can't go home. So a lot of these veteran players like Richard Sherman and Trent Williams, who uh, Washington football team fans know very well, uh, have, have really done their best to keep these guys clued in and ready to rock and roll with this. But Kyle has just kind of expressed some frustration with the county government because the county government kind of laid this on them right before they went to L.A. They kind of found out just as they were boarding the plane, they weren't going to be able to go back to their families. He's not very happy about that. And. The animosity between the county and the team ever since that stadium is built has just been kind of building and building and building. And this just feels like a giant middle finger from the county to the team. And it's just something you don't want to see. So really, these two have to work on that relationship and try and mend it. Because if, if this, you know, God forbid, this COVID stuff continues into next year, this is going to be tough for them to work around. I have to assume that Robert Sala is high on everybody's list. I can't imagine you expect him back next year. No, not at all. Uh, Robert Sala um, is not, I don't expect him back. I'm not saying he's not high on everybody's list. I think he's very, very high, particularly the Detroit Lions. He is from Michigan. He did start coaching at Central Michigan, actually when Joe Staley was there. So they were on the same team and coaching staff there, as was Matt LaFleur and a couple other guys. That coaching staff was stacked. Um, but Robert Sala is most likely gone. Um, his, his coaching style, he's a, he's a player's coach. He gets the most out of his guys. He took a little bit of a hit, you know, with that game against Buffalo. The defense didn't look very good, but I think the offense didn't really do the defense any favors. Defense was on the field a whole bunch. Um, and he's he's still going to be really hot because NFL teams aren't going to look at one game and go, we can't hire this guy because he lost to the Bills. The Bills are a good football team this year. So it's not it's not one you can look at and go, oh, they got boat raced by the Jets. Now, if that's the case, now we're talking about, okay, okay, what what, what happened here? But no, Robert Sala is definitely going to be very, very high on a bunch of teams' list. I fully expect him to get a head coaching job, and it's going to be great for him, and it's going to be great for the diversity of the sport because he'll be the first uh, Middle Eastern American to get a head coaching job in the NFL. Another team I would keep my eye on, the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's where the 49ers hired him from. He was a linebacker's coach there, and they also have uh, you know, their owner is also Arab. So maybe that's a direction he wants to go. He wants to break that barrier down. But either way, we're going to see him as a head coach of a different football team next year. And you'd assume that Shanahan promotes from within. He generally has had a history of doing that. Is that right? Yeah. Um, my number one guy that I think would get the job is D'Amico Ryans. He's been the quality control coach for a couple of years now. He's been learning the system in and out. He's a young guy that can get the most out of his players, just like Robert Sala. Kind of brings that same energy. A lot of people have suggested Chris Kosarek, who is the defensive line coach but Chris Kosarek has been on record saying that he doesn't want to be a defensive coordinator he knows his lane and he wants to stay in his lane he wants to continue coaching defensive linemen and he's got a nice stable of them there you know once you take out all the injury stuff in San Francisco to kind of keep working with those guys well you brought it up uh San Francisco reminds me a whole lot this year of Washington teams past they have been banged up early and often uh who who is but who is starting this week? I mean, they're missing a lot of people. They are missing a lot of people. Um, you're going to see guys like, uh, obviously, Nick Bose has been out all year. Obviously, D Ford's been out all year. Their center, uh, Western Richburg. Um, but most of them are back and healthy now, uh, except for the guys that went on season ending IR. Uh, Sherman is back. You know, you got uh, Jimmy Ward's back. Uh, who else? Raheem Mostert's back. Jeff Wilson's back. 
uh, Debo and Brandon Ayuk. So the, the only guys that are really going to be missing this week are Jimmy Garoppolo and George Kittle. They were kind of on the fence of maybe they'll play, maybe they won't. Um, I think if they beat Buffalo two nights ago on Monday Night Football, maybe those guys try and come back. But since they couldn't pull that win off and they're kind of fading in the playoff picture, maybe they're not trying to rush these guys back for any kind of injuries. How impressed were you by Josh Allen that other day? He looked great. Oh, I've been on the Josh Allen hype train since the start. I actually really liked him coming out of college. I knew his accuracy was terrible. I knew that was the number one ding on him, but he's a gamer. And that's the way I, that's the way I put it. I watched him, uh, you know, when we talk with Mike Tanier on our show Sunday nights, he said that people are mad at Josh Allen because the Buffalo Bills did this the right way. They, they, they draft a rookie. They sit him for a little bit. He takes his lumps. Sophomore year, he progresses a little bit. And in his third year, he has a little bit of a breakout season. They've kept the same coaching staff around him. Brian Dable has been a great offensive coordinator for him. He's worked his skill set perfectly. And people are like, well, Josh Allen was bad before. How can he be good now? It's, that's, that's what you're supposed to do with young quarterbacks. You're supposed to develop them. That's, right. that's, that's the whole point of drafting a guy. So I think Buffalo has done it the absolute right way. And Josh Allen was incredibly impressive. He moved in the pocket. He was able to uh, dodge sacks. He was able to extend plays. And his accuracy was really good. Monday night for that being the number one thing he gets hit on. It was really good Monday night. 49ers got two linebackers. I don't know how they found them in the draft, but Dre uh, Greenlaw and Fred are excellent. Yeah, Fred Warner, I think, is the best linebacker in the league, full stop. I really do believe that. Um, he plays the pass extremely well. He's He hunts very, very wisely. Uh, he was within – uh, three inches and a flag of coming up with three takeaways himself on Monday night. He recovered a fumble. He had an interception. It was called back for an illegal contact. And then he almost picked off Josh Allen over the middle with, I mean, just, just out of his, just right there outside of his fingertips. Uh, I think he's, he's incredible and he's, he's a super humble guy. And, you know, you just like his approach to the game. And then Drake Greenlaw, a second year guy, they drafted him out of Arkansas in the fifth round. He's developed nicely. So he played, he played mostly safety in college that kind of got him to beef up and play alongside line uh, alongside Fred at the linebacker position. And he, he is still struggling with some reads. Uh, Buffalo took advantage of him a little bit. They kind of got him in open space and made him choose between A and B. And even just a slight hesitation is just enough, you know, boom, you're going to give up a bunch of yards. But, uh, but for a second year guy that is playing pretty much out of position at the NFL level, he's developed very, very nicely. And uh, that those two are probably among the best starting tandems in the league right now. Do the corners travel? Who will be tasked with slowing Terry McLaurin down? Oh, goodness gracious. Terry McLaurin gives me nightmares. He is so good. I love that kid. Um, uh, I have a lot of fantasy football stock in him. I've got five fantasy football teams this year, and he is on every single one of them. I love Terry McLaurin. Um, who's going to travel? I don't think anyone's going to travel with him. The 49ers play mainly zone, um, and that's because of Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman is a really good corner, but he's lost pretty much all of his speed at this point in his career. He can't stay with guys one-on-one, -on -one, and that's Buffalo really took advantage of that. They were able to, to confuse the zone coverages and to get them to miscommunicate. I don't think anyone's going to travel with him, but uh, I would expect that if someone does, it would be more Jason Verrett than Richard Sherman because Jason Verrett can still move a little bit better. Uh, but really slowing him down is going to come from the pass rush, and they're going to have to get at Alex Smith early because Alex Smith, you know, 49ers fans love him. God, we love that guy. Uh, he's a – he's a guy that you got to get in his face and you got to get in early because he gets rid of the ball so fast that he's so quick at making reads and he's so efficient with the football that really, if you can't get in his face, he can kind of dink and dunk and pick you apart moving down the field. Is this the last year of uh, Richard Sherman in San Francisco? I think so. Uh, Richard Sherman case came out himself and said that he doesn't foresee himself re-signing with the 49ers. The 49ers are entering cap hell this off season with the cap set to go down. Um, they have a lot of hard decisions to make between guys like Jimmy Garoppolo, D4, Weston Richburg, um, a lot of high-priced guys. They're not going to be able to sign everyone back. They they have to sign basically half their roster uh, with free agency and, and draft and everything. So I don't foresee Richard Sherman coming back. He has said in the past that he would not mind moving to safety. But which safety position would he play in San Francisco? I don't know. They have Jimmy Ward. They have Tarverius Moore. Um, and, and Sherman, like I said, he doesn't have the speed anymore, so he can't be your single high guy. And I think he'd actually be more successful running kind of a buzz coverage and maybe playing a little bit of strong safety in the box. But I really don't think he's back next year. I think he's going to move on to greener pastures. On offense, you've got like a uh, 2012 Washington football team vibe going on there. What are the guys doing there? How's my, how's my guy Trent and Jason Reed doing? And 
and uh, it's um, oh, I lost his name. The right guard um, played. Yeah, uh, that's at Compton, right? Is he at yeah. right guard? Yeah, Compton started at right guard last game. Um, that's been kind of a shuffling offensive line on the right side. So they're, they they played with four different centers this year. They their original starting guard is now playing center and right tackle Mike McGlinchey has been a some people say a turnstile, but sometimes I think that's an insult to turnstiles because at least slow you down a little bit sometimes. Um, it's been pretty rough on the right side of the offensive line. Uh, Compton was signed as a depth guy. He signed as as a guy you don't want him to play consistently, but he's had to due to injury this year. So uh, Jordan Reed has has stepped up in big games. He had a touchdown catch in garbage time against uh, against Buffalo, but he's been a he's been a nice compliment. It's really a shame that we never got to see him and George Kittle on the field at the same time because we know Shanahan loves to run two tight end sets because he can run the ball out of it. And when you got guys like Reed and Kittle, you can definitely pass out of it. Uh, on the other side of the ball, on the other side of the line, Trent Williams is oh god, he's good. To, in order to go from Joe Staley. Um, you know, who we had on the fourth and goal podcast, who's an awesome guy. I say he's a Hall of Fame player, better person. To go from a guy like Joe Staley, who's been there for 13 years, who never had a question who was playing left tackle, to Trent Williams, that's such a huge transition. And I think it's very imperative that the 49ers bring Trent Williams back on a large contract. They're going to have to shell out to get him because he has been such a stable force for them. And not only that, he's so athletic and so fast that he can get out in front of the uh, running backs and really just – mall linebackers and safeties in the second level. So, you know, you absolutely need to see a guy like Trent Williams come back. We were spoiled to have him. Is he healthy again? He is. He is. He's been on the COVID list twice this year. He did miss the Green Bay Packers game um, due to COVID. Uh, it turned out to be a false positive on the team. And there's a bunch of guys that missed that game. That was a whole, that was a bungle. And when you see what happened with the Ravens, or they moved the games and games and games and moved them and moved them. It's, it, it, it irks 49ers fans a little bit to think about that game. Um, but he has been healthy uh, injury-wise. He's been good, and he's been very, very, very consistent. And I think uh, oh, going against that, uh, I, almost, I almost said it. I almost said the former name. Yeah. I was, I was make sure I don't. It takes uh, time. Uh, yeah, uh, going against the football team's defensive line, whew, that, that scares me, but I think Trent's going to hold his own. Uh, is Garoppolo eligible to come back at all this season? Will he come back this season? What's going on with him? He is eligible to come back. So IR this year, you no, know, got transferred to just three weeks and then you can come off it. He's already been on it for three weeks. So he is eligible to come back. Will he? I don't know. He had a couple in ankle injuries and those are really tough for quarterbacks to come back on because if you can't trust your bottom half to, to physically hold up to a pass, it's going to be a rough game. And I think that's what we saw. They tried to kind of bring him back a little bit early from one and he just didn't have the confidence in it, even though he was medically cleared and it just didn't go well. It's been kind of a disaster of a year for Jimmy Garoppolo this year. Um, I don't think he comes back this year unless they really, really, really make the playoff push. But in order to do that, they would have to win the next three to get to eight and seven. Um, and then previous to playing maybe Seattle in week 17, we might see him make a return. But other than that, I really don't see him coming back. It's interesting when uh, Chris Cooley had his radio station uh, show when Mullins was coming out. He actually was high on him, and I know we're still friends with Shanahan at the time, and then said he was high on him. Uh, wh what's the dichotomy there between Garoppolo and Mullins? I know Mullins is inconsistent uh, a little bit. Neither Are either one of them the solution going forward, do you think? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think Mullins is a fantastic backup quarterback. I think that's exactly where he lives to be. He understands the offense very, very well, and he can he can just run through it all. It's just he's physically not as gifted as these other guys, and that's what led to him being an undrafted free agent, right? You don't pick up a guy that's an undrafted free agent and expect him to go win you a Super Bowl. You pick him up, and you hope you can develop them into a strong backup quarterback, maybe a spot starter. And what we've seen from Nick Mullins this year is his most successful time at quarterback has been in his like first or maybe first and a half starts. Uh, so you look at – when Garoppolo went down against the Jets in the first half, Mullins comes out, plays well in the second half, and then plays really well against the Giants. And then the Eagles, who now have a week and a half of, of tape on him, are able to kind of zone in on what he does well and what he likes to fall back on. And we saw the same, the same thing the second time Garoppolo went down against Seattle. Mullins comes in and lights it up in the fourth quarter. But, you know, the next week, they, they've kind of figured him out a little bit again. And it, it's... He looks okay against the Rams. He made some throws he needed to make. I didn't think he looked terrible against Buffalo. His stat line looks really good. Um, you know, he threw for three, three touchdowns over 300 yards, but how much of that was in garbage time, you know, how much of that when the game was already out of hand. 
Uh, Mullins has his physical limitations. Garoppolo has his not only physical limitations, but also I don't think he processes the game super fast and he doesn't make the correct reads all the time. I don't think the solution for the long term is on the roster right now. I've been saying that since like week four. I, I really have not been high on the 49ers quarterbacks this year. And it's not a slight against them. Jimmy Garoppolo is fine. They can win some games with him. But the, the way I put it is you can win with a quarterback that comes with physical limitations, but you can't win with a quarterback that has physical limitations and constrains your cap. And I think that's what Garoppolo does for them. If they want to win long term, I think they have to move on from Garoppolo. Hold on to Mullins because you want that solid backup guy that knows the offense in and out. But really, I think they got to move off Garoppolo this year. And you think they'll do that in the draft or they're going to be in the Stafford sweepstakes? Or what do you think they would prefer there? Are they in, I guess, what's are they in win now mode? I think they're in win now mode, but I think they also realize that they can win now with a rookie quarterback. Um, they, you, you take away all the injuries from this team and they come back and they're strong. You know, they get Bosa back, they get another edge rusher, you know, they come back healthy on offense. They can run the ball, they can play solid defense, and they can kind of walk a quarterback along. Um, I would love Stafford personally. I think Stafford is one A for me because I still think that guy has five to seven years left of left in uh, left in him of good football. There we go. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. Uh, big fan of Stafford. Everybody likes to kind of dog him for not winning, but he's been stuck on an, in that franchise his entire career, and he's kind of carried them whenever he could. If you look at his career stats, they're fantastic. You look at him on the field; he, he navigates the pocket very well. He's got an incredibly strong arm. He can get the ball downfield. He's smart when he needs to be. I love Stafford. Um, I know that Adam Peters, the 49ers assistant GM, basically was at BY, was at Boise State to watch BYU play. So I've physically seen Zach Wilson play a game. Uh, do they go maybe somebody like Trey Lance, who as a JMU guy myself, I love FCS football. So seeing a guy like come out of North Coast State like Trey Lance, I would love that. Um, I think what is end up going to happen is they stick with Garoppolo and draft a guy or they sign kind of a cheap vet draft a guy or they go for one of these veteran guys like Matt Ryan, like Matt Stafford and, and try and continue the Super Bowl window. Kyle will never admit it, but I got to imagine he had this game circled with stars around it. His time didn't end great with the Shanahan family and the franchise. I got to imagine he's amped for this. Do you think the players feel it? I definitely think the players feel it. I definitely think they do. So this is the second straight year they're playing the Washington football team. You know, of course, they played last year. I was at that game. It was the 9-0 Mud Bowl where nothing – it was raining. Best, right? It was raining sideways, and you couldn't do anything in that game. Uh, there's, there's a time when Garoppolo had Dante Pettis down the sideline wide open, and I was sitting like first row in the upper bowl, and the ball was at about – not quite eye level, but I could just see the ball fly through the air and just like stop and just die and be an interception because the rain just beat the ball down. So I, I know he has, I know Kyle has it circle. Cause yeah, that, that did not end well. Uh, I was living in Northern Virginia at the time when that, when that breakup happened. So I know it did not come to a, a solid end. Um, the team is definitely amped up. I think after this loss to Buffalo, I think they really want to go out and prove that they're not a team that gets pushed around and uh, seeing Washington beat Pittsburgh this week on the same night. It's it's a extra motivation to want to go out and beat the team that beat Pittsburgh on top of it being the Washington football team uh, who Kyle Shanahan is not super happy with. I don't know. I think it might be bridge under the or water under the bridge well, at this it, point. It's but been a while. But... It's been a while. And, and, you know, they've already played once. So I, I don't know if it's circled, circled. But uh, I definitely think that there's some motivation to go out there and win. When do they, when do they fly out? Are they going to just stay in Arizona for a couple of weeks then? Or what's the plan there? Yep, they yeah, are staying right. in Arizona. They are they're staying in a hotel in Arizona. Um, team is pretty much on lockdown. Uh, they're not allowed to go anywhere. They're not allowed to see anybody. They're not allowed to do a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, they're pretty much just focused on football at this point. Um, not going home until after this week. So after this week, I think uh, they'll they'll be able. They're going to Dallas. They're going to Dallas, and after Dallas, they'll be able to go back home. So it's going to be a solid you know, four weeks on the road because they were at LA two weeks in Arizona, one in Dallas. So, yeah, it's going to be a long time for the gold. Matt, what do you guys got coming up on the 4th and Gold podcast? Uh, yeah, coming up. So we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a preview of the game with our guy George Templeton from PFN, and then we're also going to be speaking with Fred Smoot, former Washington football team player on Friday night. So really, really looking forward to doing that. He's part of the Believe podcast network. So we got yeah. a couple pods this week coming up just because 
I mean, we keep getting these awesome guests and it's just fantastic to just line up and talk with these guys. And it's always fun to talk to former players who just kind of let it rip and say, and, and, you know, I was going to say, you got to be on your uh, toes for the mouth of the South there. Oh yeah. No, we're super ready for Fred. Uh, it's it's going to be exciting. We, you know, um, get it, like I said, getting these former players and just letting them go out and speak their mind. It's, it's really interesting to hear them talk because they've got such a unique perspective of having played the game and played for some of these coaches and, and, and had these experiences of going on the road and, and playing in big games, and all that stuff. So it's, it's always really, really fun to talk with these guys. Yeah, no doubt. Matt, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Anytime, Doug. Thanks for having me on, man. All right, man.